myself with my own patients, uh, specifically consented by each and every one of my patients. And I have no sponsorship, no, uh, nor financial relationship to disclose. So as um, I was briefly introduced, I was in Boston. I lived for eight years. I graduated from uh, Boston University for my dental degree and further pursued the prosthodontics program at Harvard. I did my doctor of medical science uh, in research in the teaching engineering lab, Dr. Meyer Inspector. And uh, I feel grateful that I had an opportunity studying prosthodontics with such an amazing faculties and colleagues. And um, all of us are practicing prosthodontics around the world now. And I feel highly proud of them uh, whenever I see their posts on Instagram with amazing patient cases. <clears throat> and here I am in New York, you know, uh, as you can see, such a nice view probably from the Midtown. Um, and you can appreciate there is a high building in the middle. Uh, it's called the Empire State Building. And the reason why I'm showing you this photograph is if you see how this building was constructed in order to construct such a high rise building, there gotta be a huge effort of planning and manpower. And um, most importantly, before the, you know, the head architecture engineer comes up with a specific action plans of phases and sequences, they do not really begin anything. Uh, they need to apply like constructional engineering principles uh, where the building shouldn't be affected by strong wind power along with a structural integrity with a strong base under the ground. This engineering concept uh, applies to the, the exact same in the field of full mouth reconstruction. <clears throat> the architectural engineering concept derives mathematical ratios and geometric rules and the principles of tooth preparation. And once decided, one should follow such an algorithmic principles of tooth preparation in arts and science. And, and biologic, mechanical, and aesthetic rules uh, should serve as a foundational baseline. And as you can see, there are so many factors, uh, you know, in order to have a successful full mouth reconstruction. And uh, we cannot go over every single aspect of it today for the sake of the time of the lecture. But um, <clears throat> two critical things uh, would be the clinical and foundational part. And uh, I, I, I do highly value both of them. You know, we, we definitely need a clinical expertise when we see those full mouth re rehabilitation cases. But at the same time, uh, we shouldn't forget about the foundational, uh, the knowledge, because that's the baseline to, to, to give a proper treatment to the patients. And as our title shows, uh, at arts and science, um, you know, we exactly apply the same analogy to the clinical and foundational uh, aspects. Uh, like, like uh, we have autopilot mode for the airplane <clears throat> and pilots should still be able to manage how to fly an airplane. And it's the same thing to the modern dentistry these days. We have, we have a digital dentistry and, and, the, and the modern technology is getting better every day, but the foundation is still absolutely critical. The, the conventional foundation is such an excellent way to, to build the basic principles and foundations in dentistry. So uh, what is exactly the full mouth uh, rehabilitation? So this is another uh, one of my case that, that I finished um, during my residency. And I would like to introduce my definition of the full mouth rehab would be the simultaneous uh, reconstruction of both anterior and posterior dentitions to rehabilitate new, new aesthetics, occlusion and function. It doesn't have to be every single tooth for, for the upper and lower arches, but as long as you manipulate and then you, you change the whole dynamics of aesthetics, occlusion and function, and, and then touching the interior and posterior simultaneously, I, I, I would definitely consider this as a full mouth rehabilitation. <clears throat> so types of patients, when you see, uh, you know, everyday basis as a reconstructive dentist or as a prosthodontist, these are types of cases that you get the referral or as a new diagnostic visit. And uh, um, if there are dental students in this, you know, the lecture, you may be surprised to see those type of complexities of the cases. But when you see uh, such cases, you should be able to map out the action plans in order to treat those full mouth rehabilitations properly. And those are the kinds of things that I would like to touch up today during my lecture. And along with the foundational part, uh, I may give you some of the clinical tips of, of my daily basis, a routine care to the patient. So. <clears throat> 
hopefully you can enjoy it. So uh, before we begin anything, uh, I think it's important to have you know, indication of the full mouth reconstruction because not every patient is a candidate for, for these uh, you know, huge constructive um, you know, activity. So <clears throat> in order to have a green light to, to start the treatment, I would say we need to have a thorough understanding of the patient's expectation fully. And the patient should understand my expectation as a clinician so that we both have the same consensus in order to move on to the same direction of our treatment route. And the finance is also another important because we shouldn't underestimate the, 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 uh, the fact of the laboratory fees and the treatment fees uh, and also in the material fees. So uh, depending on the patients, of the, you know, the finance status uh, as a clinician, we should provide uh, ideal and alternative uh, treatment plans for the patient. So they let them decide. <clears throat> and we also need a commitment from both patients and clinicians. You know, we sometimes categorize patients with a philosophical, exacting, hysterical, indifferent. And then, you know, we also ourselves should be uh, highly committed in order to pursue such a huge uh, treatment uh, as a lifetime, uh, life-changing experience for the patients. Um, and another thing I would say is a flexible appointment schedules. Uh, the patient should be available because, uh, you know, these full mouth reconstructions are not the single visit treatment but it requires multiple visits and the maintenance care. Um, and last but not the least, um, the clinician, the reconstructive dentist, should dissect the case in and out with a comprehensive treatment planning with proper phases and sequences. <clears throat> and later I will uh, elaborate the non-destructive equilibrium. Uh, and what I mean by the non-destructive equilibrium is such a critical component in the full mouth reconstruction is the hygiene. So this is an, another patient case of mine. Uh, when the patient presents to you like this, a couple of things that you can think yourself, how is the oral maintenance, uh, previous experience of any deterioration issues. Um, so there are several risk factors that you can go with the patient as a historical assessment. You know, whether the patient had any history carries, uh, and, uh, you know, how many, the frequency of dental visits, how many times brushes, those are a very good pieces of information you should attain uh, at the first visit before you begin anything so that you sort of, as a data collection, you understand the patient, where the patient comes from. And, you know, whether the frequent snacking or the behavioral, the socioeconomic status and educational level, all of that would be a very valuable uh, information to start uh, to, to attain those informations to initiate the reconstruction treatment for the patient. <clears throat> And of course, you should look for the clinical aspects as well. Um, you know, <clears throat> you can even perform bacterial load tests or you know saliva amount tests, and uh, you can take the X-rays and the clinical evaluations, see if any previous treatment, uh, heavy restorations, uh, whether there's any defective restorations. If there is, why uh, you know, along with the marginal open, see if the anatomy of the tooth looked like the dip, pit and fissures, whether it's a cavitated or non-cavitated. So all those information as a clinician you should attain after assessing the history part of the patient. And then you go over with the patient, you can follow the camera protocol, uh, introduce the patient how to maintain his oral hygiene better. You know, you can prescribe some of the chlorhexidine treatment, uh, rinse with the xylitol, so, you know, recommending chewing the gums, biotin, saliva substitutes, uh, even with the bacterial testing. So all of those efforts should be <clears throat> well integrated together in order to make our goal, initial goal of, of the hygiene maintenance. So I think one thing if you get out of this lecture, one thing if you wanna remember would be the oral hygiene. And that's from my experience when I go over with those full mouth reconstructive cases, that's the, one of the critical aspects I, I truly emphasize to the patient before I begin any, pro any process of uh, you know, prepping teeth or doing surgical placement of the implants, I completely let the patient be in a status of non-destructive equilibrium in terms of hygiene so that I can deliver my prosthetic or surgical treatment to the patient. So in this case, the patient had a deep palate with undercut. I couldn't really pursue any removal or you know, financially, I couldn't afford the fixed type of restoration. So I did the telescopic coping crown 
uh, which requires a high level of hygiene care. And patients really prove that, you know, the improved uh, hygiene along the line so that we were able to you know, finish this case properly. And what about the patient missing teeth? You know, in this case, another case of mine uh, you know, had a pre-existing failing implants. We had to you know, explant all the maxillary implants followed by new full mouth implant placement with a fixed uh, maxillary and mandibular rehabilitation. And you know, if the patient has no teeth, how can we check? Well, you can deliver the denture. Uh, interim denture can be a good source of testing the patient's hygiene because if the patient cannot maintain the hygiene of the denture, if there is you know, the calculus field up around the denture, there is no way you want to pursue the next step because once you place the implants, patient cannot maintain uh, hygiene properly or even prepping teeth, it will, it will be just a time bomb. So <clears throat> I would definitely emphasize your oral hygiene, even if the patient's edentulous with a denture and let the patient take care of the denture and see if the patient can maintain the hygiene with the denture so that you can pursue the next steps. So in this case, the patient really showed his motivation of improving oral hygiene. Uh, I remember uh, asking to bring his brushing armamentarium. I sort of demonstrated right in front of the patient, you know, this is how to pro properly angle the brush, you know, the, the electric tube brush, water floss, and patient really got motivated and improved his oral hygiene. And then I, I did the full mouth implant placement on the top, on the maxillary, and then followed by by the rehabilitation on the bottom uh, dentitions as well. So, you know, the water floss, electric toothbrush, they've been, they've become like two of the most amazing armamentarium in terms of oral hygiene. You know, it, it, it jets, it removes the 99% of the plaque biofilm in three seconds and about 145% more effective than the string floss for the implant cases. So, you know, not only as, as a pretreatment armamentarium, I always, uh, you know, recommend the patient to make a routine oral hygiene care for the rest of their maintenance, even after delivering the, prosth the, the prosthetic, uh, uh, the, the crowns and the, the dentures or implant crowns. So the rule number one A would be <clears throat> test driving the patient's oral hygiene improvement uh, via either uh, the pre-existing dentitions or interim removable processes. And and then establish a routine hygiene maintenance of, of proper electric tube brush and water floss from the patient side. You can give the best cleaning to the patient, but if the patient cannot maintain, then you know we cannot really pursue the next step. So once the patient really shows the motivation and then you know improves his or her oral hygiene, and that becomes the green light of, of my full mouth reconstruction. And then I start thinking more in depth and thoroughly, uh, planning out, you know how to initiate this case. I can dissect the case since then and come up with a specific action plans with the proper phases and sequences, which are two of the most critical parts for successful comprehensive uh, you know, reconstructive dentistry. And then you know, there are many factors, but the phases, proper phases and sequences, uh, this will you know, lead us into the successful reconstruction. <clears throat> so uh, about a few weeks ago, uh, I, I went for a gun firing uh, not because I was angry about this all COVID outbreak situation, but for a leisure activity. And I, I realized that uh, this is exactly the same process uh, in a comprehensive treatment planning in dentistry, in, in reconstructive dentistry. Um, you know, we all know there are phases and sequences, but I came up with slightly different terms of preliminary phase, which is diagnostic and stabilizing, which, which can be viewed as a loading and aiming part of the gunfire and the execution phase, the surgical and temporizing, uh, the, the temporization phase would be the pulling the trigger. And the definitive phase as a restorative uh, delivering the final processes would be the heating the target, uh, followed by the maintenance phase, which it would be the evaluation of the gun firing situation. So <clears throat> the FMR rule number two would be the comprehensive treatment planning with proper phases and sequences. And moving on to the next step uh, would be, you know, the occlusion is something that you have heard and will be hearing all the time. It's something that will stay with us from the beginning to the end of full mouth reconstruction if you're doing it. You know, there are so many factors, so many terms uh, in terms of uh, occlusion, but we may not necessarily, you know, being able to visualize those factors altogether. 
So uh, today, uh, although I cannot go too detail uh, in the field of occlusion, because our lecture focus is the full math reconstruction in general, but you know we'll definitely touch up some of the you know the pretreatment occlusal analysis, followed by you know when we are fabricating crown for the final processes, what things we should look for, uh, and then we can test and assess the patient status. <clears throat> So this is a patient that I saw, uh, you know, a few weeks ago here in New York City, and you know, when the patient presents like this, you know, as a reconstructive dentist, uh, you you should be asking yourself certain questions uh, to start assessing this patient's status. So what would be the current occlusal status? What would be the history of this much deterioration of the teeth? Is there any posterior stop I can utilize? Is there any prematurity or interferences of occlusion? Has there been any occlusal trauma? Is it primary, secondary trauma? If we are pursuing to the full mouth reconstruction, how are we going to provisionalize? Uh, any FMA angle issues, worn down dentitions? Are we going to alter the occlusal vertical dimension? Any range of motion issues? Skeletal classification? All of those questions, and there gotta be more questions than this, but you, you should be asking yourself in order to properly initiate the, the, the initial diagnostic part of you know, the, the case so that you can pursue the, the next step. And, and this was my second visit of this case. You know, I decided to prep and temp the full arch maxilla mandible. And I took a DICOM CBCT right away so that we can plan the implant positions and we are placing implants next visit. So if you don't ask those questions at the beginning, uh, you know, there's no way you can plan out with proper action plans with uh, phases and sequences. So it's critical to understand, um, you know, the importance of the plan, the planning and, and the phases with sequences. So as I mentioned, um, you know, when the patient presents to you, uh, certain things you want to look up for, uh, you know, the occlusal analysis. Uh, one of the thing is deflective occlusal contact. By definition, uh, from the GPT, is a contact uh, displacing a tooth and diverting the mandible from the intended movement. So basically, you know, it could be any direction. It could be protrusive direction, non-working, working direction. But the bottom line is the patient has a, the, the initial point of the contact, and that sort of displaces the whole mandible uh, to the unideal direction. Uh, quite frankly, everybody has some sort of premature contact. But you know we we have the maximum uh, the maximum intercostal position where the maximum surface contact with the teeth sort of stabilize your occlusion. <clears throat> this become critical for the implant crowns, especially like single unit implant crowns. If you have a severe deflective occlusion, it may affect like non axial forces, and you know that could lead into mechanical failures like a screw loosening or with fractures. And the lever classifications. So we all know that the mandible. Uh, with the mutually protected occlusion, we have some uh, fishing pole type of appearance, which is a lever uh, class three. And we have a loading in the front, fulcrum from the condyle, and we have resulting forces in the middle. And once we have a higher contact, hyperocclusion on the posterior and interferences, we tend to have the lever changing to the class one type of non-ideal, uh, the fulcrum and the loading. <clears throat> So when the patient presents to you uh, with severe uh, you know, worn down dentitions, uh, of course you should perform the, the occlusal analysis and see if you see, uh, you can detect any of those excursive interferences. There are different types of excursive interferences like protrusive interferences, working and non-working interferences. And you should, you should definitely perform such occlusal analysis at this moment in time in order to understand the patient more thoroughly and then plan out your you know, occlusal rehabilitation and you can picture what type of occlusal scheme and shape of the teeth that you want to rehabilitate for this case. Because if you don't picture this, uh, there's no way you can rehabilitate with the proper shape of the teeth later. So it's absolutely critical to attain those informations as early as possible, uh, preferably before even prepping the teeth so that you can deliver the, the, the final processes in an ideal way. <clears throat> and another thing I want to emphasize is the range of motion. You know, so many people underestimate this aspect, but you know, we, we have envelope of motion and function. 
but uh, you know, Okisun came out with the maximum amount of you know, the range of motion, 40 to 60 millimeters with the rotational CR position, 20 millimeters hinge axis, the rotational movement, and the man and female, male and female have different range of motions. Um, why are we looking at those range of motions? <clears throat> it's because you know, we are quite limited with the posterior due to the posterior space due to the arc of closure. You know, imagine you're doing full guided implant surgery where you should put all of it, all those instruments on the posterior region and you can't really put it in due to the patient's insufficient mouth opening. That, that will become an issue. So before you're planning any surgeries, uh, you should definitely plan out and see how much opening you have uh, for this type of procedure. And not only the surgical, but when you're inserting crown, imagine you're inserting a single unit posterior uh, screw retain one piece implant crown. If the patient cannot open, you know, you will have a hard time to insert it. So such things as a practical point of view, uh, you know, you, you should definitely evaluate the range of motion of the patient so that you can uh, plan out your, 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 your next treatment properly. So the rule number three, A, would be addressing the deflective occlusal contacts and excursive interferences. And three B would be the checking the range of motion. Some of the basic things, but you know, as an action plan, as a to-do list, you should definitely go over those. <clears throat> and we move on to the uh, next most commonly addressed, uh, you know, topic: the occlusal vertical dimension. Um, you know, its definition is, is the between two selected anatomic mark points according to pleasure, the nose and the chin. We evaluate you know, the, the difference between uh, the VDR and VDO, you know, that that's quite common, uh, you know, evaluation process. And then VDR is the posture of position of the mandible uh, with a minimal muscle contraction. So <clears throat> we evaluate those VDO, VDR. I'm sure you heard about those terms a lot, but what exactly, how exactly can we evaluate those? Well, there are, there, there are the whole bunch of, uh, you know, the, the methods to go over with. So, we go with the phonetics, you know, one of the basic uh, you know, steps that we can perform with the patient, uh, you know, S sound, M sound, M and FMV sound, Sibelian, the uh, fricative sound we can perform. Uh, we can exercise with the patient to evaluate the, the, the closer vertical uh, dimension. And uh, the closest speaking space, uh, you know, specifically you're looking for the incisal edge of the maxilla, the maxillary teeth contacting the, the vermilion border of the lower lip. When, when pronouncing F and B sounds. I mean, I'm talking about the skeletal class one type of patient. It, it really depends on different skeletal classifications, but for class type one type uh, of normal population, uh, we're looking for uh, the, the mandibular anterior teeth, the incisal edge of the mandibular teeth should be slightly lingual to the maxillary incisal edge, and at the same time have uh, clearance of not less than one millimeter, never more than two millimeter uh, when pronouncing S sound. So, so such things you want to evaluate and go over with the patient, see if the patient can perform those exercises properly and you have a better understanding of the patient's vertical. And you know, it's not just the pretreatment phase, but also after you're, when you're delivering the temporary or definitive processes, you can perform these uh, assessment tool kit, uh, I mean, process to evaluate the, the, the vertical dimension. And the facial soft tissue contour is also critical. You know, <clears throat> when we are evaluating the measurements, the patient should not exhibit any facial strain. So typically when the patient lost the vertical dimension, you know, the very typical symptom, uh, you know, appearance that the drooping line of the lip, you know, we can recognize, you know, such the collapsed vertical uh, with the facial from the extra oral uh, reference. <clears throat> and we can also perform swallowing. You know, if you are to record the vertical dimension or rest position with the cephalomatrix, you can ask the patient to swallow so that you can generate these, uh, the, the, the physiologic rest position, and then you can uh, take the decentrical the the, the occlusion and you know, do the difference between those two, and you can actually measure the vertical dimension information on the cephalomatrix as well. <clears throat> and we have aesthetics and facial dimensions. You know, the lower one third of the face, it should be in harmony with the rest of the face. Some of the basic stuff, you know, the, the barely detectable difference between the VDO and VDR and uh, such things can be important to, to, to start your, your, your treatment planning. And the pre-extraction pre records, you know, if you're doing full mouth extractions or even 
get a referral uh, from another dentist and you know pre-extraction record can be a good piece of information as well. Um, <clears throat> the physiologic rest position, as I mentioned, you know, Pleasure came up with the nose and chin uh, dot concept and uh, the intraoclusal space is approximately three millimeters for the class one type of skeletal case. It could be ranging up to, from one to six millimeters, but you know, you, you can perform those exercises of physiologic rest position with the patient and you know the worn down dentitions you know the, a lot of times if you're a reconstructive dentist i'm sure you will go through this uh with those uh, with such cases like worn down dentitions if you see what are the things that you're looking for and then later i will elaborate more in detail but you know the the worn down dentition the pattern of the the wear and then the location of the wear is also a good piece of information when you're evaluating vertical dimension <clears throat> And the wrist parallelism, I mean, it's a concept that comes from a denture, um, more or less, but, you know, we are, we have a favorable direction of the forces, thus we can increase the stability of denture, but, you know, we can apply the same, <clears throat> same analogy to, to the fixed rehabilitation as well. You know, this case was a fully dentures in the maxilla and that we didn't have any reference to start with, then we can, you know, use the ridge parallelism concept to, to sort of initiate our, our estimated the vertical dimension to start with. Same thing as average distance. By the McCrane, we have 22 millimeters of the maxilla, the maxillary labial vestibule to the inside of the edge, and the mandibular labial vestibule to the inside of the edge, it's approximately 18 millimeter. So it's the same denture concept, you know, foundation knowledge from denture, but we can apply to the full mouth reconstructive, uh, full mouth reconstruction uh, scenarios, especially uh, in the implant support full mouth rehab. We can utilize because a lot of times we convert from removable processes to to uh, the fixed type of restorations. And as I mentioned, you know we can use the follow matrix. Um, you know the, the take a VDO and VDO and VDR and take the difference on the cephalo matrix, and you can analyze along with other <coughs> aspects of the angular the correlation on the cephalo matrix. Out of all, uh, it's absolutely critical to note that. You know, we, are, we shouldn't be relying on to one factor, but when you're evaluating the vertical dimension, you, you should you know, apply as many factors as possible to, to fully have a grasp of understanding the patient's the vertical dimension. <clears throat> and so that we can increase the accuracy and the reliability of the evaluation process. So, <clears throat> When the patient has excessive or insufficient the vertical dimension, uh, obviously, you know, in the practical point of view and in a clinical setting, the patient experience with the symptoms. So, you know, you can you can go over those checklists like the clenching of the teeth, muscle fatigue, headaches, teeth intrusion, fracturing respirations, occlusal instability. You can go over uh, in order to evaluate the insufficiency of the vertical dimension. Same thing to the excessive vertical dimension. If the patient has excessive vertical dimension, obviously muscle pain will be involved and tooth intrusion, mobility, myofascial pain, some of the crustal bone loss, the muscle force increasing while lowering the EMG uh, you know, level. So those are things that you, sh you can go over as a, a sort of checklist uh, to see the insufficiency and excessiveness of the vertical dimension. And when you're entering to the, to, to the real treatment of the patient, what are the things that we can test with the vertical dimension? We can do the occlusal splint, you know, just like occlusal guard, we can increase the vertical dimension, whether it's a sectional or full arch, we can <clears throat> test with a new level of the vertical dimension with a patient, or we can utilize holly type of retainers uh, if, if there are some compromised teeth and we don't know whether we want to save them or not, we can test with the holly retainers and sort of phase out your treatment sequences. And same thing to the internal removal processes, or we can even do the buildups, the composite buildups. If you're doing full mouth re, uh, prep and tap on the maxilla with a mill temporaries, and then you want to, you know, you don't have really time to do all the maxilla mandible at the same time, you can choose to build up on the mandible until your next visit. So uh, you can definitely do that. But <clears throat> more or less, uh, you know, a lot of times we do the provisional in, in the setting of the full mouth rehabilitation. Uh, we prefer to use a provisional, full mouth uh, provisional, whether meal or making a shell, 
uh, that's our preference so that we can uh, check not only the vertical dimension, but also the ideal shape of the tooth morphology we are, we are sort of fine tuning uh, throughout the treatment. <clears throat> So the rule number four uh, would be evaluating the pre-existing vertical dimension uh, with multiple methods, not a single factor, but multiple methods, and designing is, is a trajectory plan for temporary and definitive stage. And, and the next thing I want to evaluate as a, at this diagnostic phase would be the interoclusal rest space. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, you're more familiar with the term uh, physiologic rest position. Basically, it's a postural, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a myotactic reflex where the patient, uh, we can evaluate at the patient's an incisal length and the width of the smile at, at, at this repose position so, so that we can have a uh, more full understanding, understanding of the smile analysis. Later, I will uh, discuss more in detail about dissecting the smile anatomy, but you know, that's the this uh, physiologic rest position would be the baseline to start with. And a voucher came up with, you know, depending on <clears throat> the different skeletal classification, you have different range of these interoclusal rest space, the physiologic rest space. And why is it important? Because if you imagine if you're to increase the vertical dimension of the patient, then, you know, depending on the available space we have, that sort of dictate us the cuspal shape and how much vertical dimension we can increase. So these are definitely critical information that, you know, the functional range of the patient in daily basis, they changes as well. So uh, in, if, you're, if you're doing reconstructive dentistry, then you should definitely reference from here. <clears throat> Another important part is when you're changing the vertical dimension, FMA angle, uh, according to Di Pietro, uh, is, is also a, can be a critical piece of information. Um, you know, the Frankfurt horizontal to the mandibular angle you have a you have FMA angle, and and you can use this as a diagnostic tool uh, where the average value for this is about twenty five, <clears throat> with an error of five, and if it's lower than twenty, then uh, the literature supports that you know it, it can be more prone to the fracture. So imagine you're increasing vertical dimension, with the patient's so, so much masticatory muscles, uh, excessive masticatory muscles, and then the low FMA angle. If you're to increase the vertical, you'll be a lot more cautious. And then maybe you want to extend the provisional phase to see whether a patient can tolerate this level of increase of vertical dimension. So, you know, these are, this is some of the numerical mathematical information that, you know, you can utilize for the full mouth reconstruct reconstructive cases. Worn down dentitions, you know, some of the terms that you're familiar with, attrition, abrasion, erosion, effraction. So all of those terms, they mean differently and you should be able to recognize them not only recognize it, but being able to come up with the proper etiology of why the patient has a breach, why you see the erosion surfaces on the posterior, why is it only anterior. Depending on those, uh, you know, you sort of become a detective when you're seeing those type of and deterioration of the teeth. So, you know, you have a literature that has a systematic algorithmic pathway where, where you can fine tune the etiology of it. So, you know, it could be both mechanical, chemical, combination of it. And then you figure out, you know, depending on the location of the anterior, posterior, and then, you know, the, you know, the erosion or mechanical, uh, you know, attrition. And then you can figure out uh, specifically why is this patient having those type of, you know, the, the, the appearance of, of, the, of the deteriorated uh, the tooth shape. It could be chronic bruxism, or it could be some of the fruit sucking habits. So some of the GERD issues. So you can fine tune the etiology of, of, of those, um, or the worn down dentitions. And obviously the patients suffer from, you know, the signs of the reduced vertical, as I mentioned, and you can go over those checklists and, you know, become a more thorough uh, data collection. And the Turner and Missourian, they came up with a different category of the worn down dentitions so that you can more, you can systematically categorize them come up with a different treatment routes. So, you know, we have a class one, most typical uh, excessive wear with the loss of vertical and class two would be excessive wear, but you, you do not see the loss of vertical dimension. Why, why is that? Because of the super eruption of the teeth. The speed of the super eruption in the anterior doesn't necessarily mean, you know, it's the same speed with the deterioration rate of the, of the tooth destruction. 
So, you know, he, he looked at those two factors and uh, came up with those three different criteria. And, you know, the criteria three, <clears throat> the category three is excessive wear without loss of vertical, but with, uh, and, and due to the super eruption, severe super eruption, we have limited space. I remember the physiologic rest space, you know, if you're limited with, the, with, with that space, imagine your severe class three type of cases, we are putting into the category three. And that is the most difficult, you know, case out of all the worn down dentitions where, you know, some of the auxiliary orthodontic treatment or pre-surgical uh, treatment would be necessary in order to move on to the next step of the full mouth reconstructions. If you see any trauma on the teeth surfaces, you should, you should also, you know, definitely figure out why the patient is suffering from that, you know, trauma, you know, whether primary, secondary trauma, if it's a secondary trauma, is it localized or generalized? You know, recognizing clinical findings is, is easy. You know, you can just, you can just uh, detect it right away. But specifying the etiology and introducing ac a specific action plan is our role as a reconstructive dentist to, to have a you know, successful full mouth reconstructions. So <clears throat> uh, the rule number 5A would be evaluating the interoclusal rest space you know, utilizing the FMA angle, patient skeletal classifications, and its dynamic relationship with changing vertical and tra trajectory cusp anatomy of our future shape of the teeth. And rule number 5B would be assessing the etiology of the worn out conditions if the patient belongs to that category and, you know, the occlusal trauma, if there's any, and followed by a systematic protective plan. So those are some of the checklists you would like to have as a diagnostic phase.